of God. Thank you. If you want to open the hood on my 2006 Honda, you do, you'd expect to do what you usually do when you open the hood on a vehicle. You reach down to your left and you grab a little plastic knob and you give it a pull. Now the key fact about this is that it's a 2006. And what starts happening to 13 year old plastic? So if you reach down and try to open the hood on my 2006 Honda, you either have to know where that wire is exactly or have a pair of pliers handy because that piece of plastic broke off a little bit ago. I have bits of plastic breaking on that device left and right. You know the cruise control, you hit a piece of plastic to turn it on, that tells a little motor in the, in the engine compartment. It has a little another piece of plastic that pushes down on the accelerator and that broke and so i hit cruise inside and the little piece that went Eek! it wasn't there and, and so my speed would just go mm. it's kind of sad another bit, bit of plastic broke on it the, the gas flap yeah you might have noticed i was driving around for quite a while without a gas flap too that was a piece, <laughs> piece of plastic that broke it happens, it's old plastic. Who here is driving, in, uh, who has the newest car here? Who has, anyone here have a 2018? 2017? Did I hear you? What, what kind of your car are you driving? It, it, I think it's a 17. Got a 17. Are, are all, is all your plastic working? Excellent! I hope your plastic lasts a long time. <laughs> at least 13 years now the question I'd want to ask is she has a nicer car than I do and, and I've been driving old cars for a while my first car was an 86 Cavalier and I started driving in 96 and I drove that for a few years I've, I've been dealing with the my, my 86 Cavalier when I'd get out of school and uh, when I was in high school I'd either have to be the first out the door or the last because I had to water it. I had to bring a liter of water every day and, and refill the radiator. And I was either going to be out of there first or out of there last because I didn't want to be watering my car in front of everybody. <laughs> you don't have to water your car, do you? That must be nice. Is she more blessed than I am because she has a nice car? It's kind of an odd question to ask, isn't it? It's a question I came across um, I, when I moved to, to North Carolina and went to start going to seminary, I came across televangelists for the first time. Y'all know what I'm talking about when I say televangelists. It's, it's the prosperity gospel preaching. And, and it's this preaching that says that um, poverty is always the consequence of sin. If you work harder, you will always do a lot better. And that financial success and physical well-being are God's promises to you. If you but have faith and call the number below, operators are standing by to take your donation to this ministry. Right? That's the prosperity gospel. And people have been preaching this for a couple decades now. People like T.L. Olson. Oral Roberts, Joel Osteen is uh, one of the, the latest, and, and you've got to love the titles of his the books. Like, Joel Osteen has a book, Your Best Life Now. Like, whew, that, that's quite the promise. My favorite of them is a kind of a not quite as well-known one, a guy by the name of A.A. A. Allen. Does anyone here remember him? He was uh, preaching in the 50s, and, and in 1953, he said uh, God had given him the ability to turn $1 bills into $20 bills. And, and I thought, A, I wish I had that ability, and B, I don't think, no, 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 no. So, uh, the prosperity gospel proclaims that you can have it all. It's all been promised. All you have to do is have a little bit of faith and send some money in. And, and I remember being exposed to that and thinking, nah. That can't be what a blessing is. That can't be what it means to be blessed. Like, I, I hope your car lasts a long time and your, your plastic always works and you never have to water your car, but I don't think that makes you more blessed than me. 
I just think that's how it works sometimes. Your car died sooner than mine. <laughs> So what does it mean to when we toss around that word blessing? We use the word a lot, and all of its permutations. It, it has an interesting past tense. I got asked about this at the last service. Blessing, to bless, the past tense can be blessed, B-L-E-S-S-E-D, or blessed, B-L-E-S-T. Both of those are the past tense of bless, so there's clear up that confusion. But um, what, when we say that something is a blessing, what are we actually saying? What are we asking? Well, I, let's turn to Scripture and, and let's, let's look at how these words are used. Uh, Deuteronomy is where one of, the, one of the first major times where blessing is, is, comes up. And it's blessing and cursing. Blessing and cursing are flip sides of the same coin. And, and so what we see is uh, Moses has gathered all the people and they're going to go into the promised land. And so this is kind of a, a quick uh, check. Like, before we go do this big thing at this major uh, point of change, let, let's, let's pause and go over how we live together as God's people. And notice that they do it in worship. Like, Because when, when Mo, uh, Moses says we're going to do this, first they build an altar, which means they do it in the context of worship. Right? The, the blessing and cursing is discerned and, and reminded and we figure it out in the context of, of worship, which is when we are attending to our relation, relationship with God. And so the blessings and the curses, curses uh, they, they go over these in Scripture whenever there's a major point. They, they worship together, and, and so it's when uh, Moses is about to bring the people to the promised land. It's when Joshua dies, and there's the next transition in leadership. It's when uh, there's about to, they go from tribal leadership to the first king, King Saul. That, at all these major points of transition, they, all the people of Israel gather together, and they go over the blessings blessings and cursings. And, uh, and this is what we see in Jesus. Jesus' greatest sermon, the Sermon on the Mount, is what it's called in Matthew. In Luke, it's called the Sermon on the Plain. Uh, he probably gave the same sermon a few times. And in the Sermon on the Plain, we have the rec recording of it, and it goes, blessed are, and goes through some things. And then, then Jesus also goes through, woe be unto you, the, the curses, right? So th this format is used throughout Scripture. And so the blessings, uh, Moses starts out, If you diligently obey the Lord your God, being careful to do all of his commandments, blessed shall you be in the city, blessed shall you be in the country, blessed shall be the offspring of your body, the produce of your ground, the offspring of your beasts. Blessed shall be your basket and your kneading bowl. The Lord will open up his storehouse, the heavens, to give rain to your land in its season and bless the work of your land. If you listen to the commandments of the Lord your God, which I charge you today to observe them carefully. So that's how blessing is described. And then the curses. Here are the curses, right? Cursed, cursed is the man who makes an idol or molten image, an abomination to the Lord. Cursed is he who dishonors his father or mother. Cursed is the one who moves his neighbor's boundary marker. Cursed is the one who misleads a blind person on the road. Cursed is he who distorts the justice due to an alien, orphan, and widow. And, and all the people respond by saying amen. And, and amen man means I agree so let it be and so this is where we start to understand first the scope of all the bless blessings and curses I mean it covers every part of life you're, you're everything from the fields you work to the the bowl in which you need your bread one other place I think is important to see and we see it most clearly how a blessing works in the beginning, God creates the heavens and the earth, and on the seventh day, what does God create? Rest, right? That's what's created on the seventh day. God creates rest. And this is the first thing that God blesses. It's in Genesis 2-3. God blessed the seventh day. What is the seventh day to be used for? Rest. Rest. And so, when God blesses the seventh day, God has declared that when this day is used well, when this uses day, day is used as it ought to be used, what do you do on it? Yes. You rest, right? You, you chill. You take a nap. You do something with family. You find joy in the day. 
based upon my reading of scripture, what I've learned from wise teachers, to bless something, to call something blessed, is to say that it is aligned with God's desires or God's plan. Right? And so God's plan for Sabbath is that you rest. Right? And then the flip of that, right? what would be a cursed Sabbath? A Sabbath in which you work. Right? And so Sabbath is a day meant for rest. And you, whether, how you take this gift and how you use it, whether you are in line, as a, it's, it's back in Deuteronomy when Moses has gathered all the people and he says, if you will diligently obey the Lord your God, be careful to do all of his commandments, all of his teachings, then there's a list of the blessings, right? If you are living in line with God's plan, with, for each of these objects, for this, these parts of your lives, then that is blessed, right? That, that is blessed. That, that is in line with God desires. And, and so if we think about how we use that term, it, if, if someone brings us food when we're sick and laid up, we'd say, wow, what a blessing. And that's perfect, right? Because that is food being used as it ought to, to heal, to feed, to bring community together. When someone gives a hand and we say, wow, what a blessing you've been, that, that is, yeah, that's indeed, that is perfect. Because you are doing, we're, we're helping each other out, and that is the, the nature of family and church to be in community. When, when, God ta when we're talking about when God blesses a field and there shall be a great crop that comes from it, yes, that's exactly what a field is supposed to be. It's blessed. It, it, it's, it's having this great crop. To say something is blessed is to say that it is, it is, is being used in line with God's plan, right, and, and desires for this day and for the kingdom to come. And to say something is blessed doesn't always mean that it is convenient or easy either, because who would be the most blessed of people ever to have lived? It's the stock answer. It's always the safe answer in church. What's well, everyone is Jesus, right? Did Je if Jesus is most blessed, and he had some very hard days, we tend to think of them as Good Friday, like the crucifixion, could you call that blessed? Was it in line with God's plan? Yes, right? It points towards the kingdom of God. It's in line with God's plan. And, and so that's an extreme example. But to say something is, is a blessing or to bless something doesn't always mean that it shall be warm and fuzzy. Right? Sometimes it, it might be hard. Sometimes it is most blessed. If, if Sunday is the day of rest, which is blessed to be in line with that, that makes Monday the day to get back to the fields. And it's hard to get back to work. But that is still blessed. That is the thing that's in line. We are made to till and to work the soil or whatever work it is we do. And so then if that's blessed, as I said, the curse, to say something is cursed is the opposite of that. A family that cannot bear children, fields that bear no crop, a Sabbath that is busy, worship that is directed to idols, a distortion of justice leading the blind off the path to fall. Like that is all cursed. Because that's not how, that's not God's will. That's not what God desires. And I have no clue why it is that we have, well, if you go by George Carlin, an authority on such matters as swearing, we have these seven words, right? That you can't, I don't know why English has the seven words and how we sort of went from cursing, which is a, a, what it means biblically, to now we have seven words that we, that we are not supposed to use unless we drop something really heavy on our toe and almost break it, which uh, I may have done recently, and I'm sorry, but I've never cursed in the sanctuary, I may have cursed downstairs. It hurt. <laughs> A lot. <laughs> uh, so, blessing. To say something is blessed is to say it's aligned with God's will. To say something is cursed is to say that it is contrary to God's will. Let's go back to the, one of the first thing, people that we talk about being blessed in Scripture. A Abraham. Abraham is told by God, I will make you a great nation and I will bless you and make your name great so that you shall be a blessing. And blessed to be a blessing, I have thought at times that this meant that I have 
lots of stuff and I should share it with people. And that's not quite it. Right? To say that we are blessed to be a blessing is to say that we first submit ourselves to being blessed. And then we invite others to be blessed as, as well, and we pray for them to be blessed, and, and we work with them. And, and I just want to make, take a moment to understand, this is kind of where the rubber hits the road. This is where it kind of it matters, right? When we pray that we might be blessed, what we are saying is, I may not be fully in line with God's will now. Can you please get me lined up? Can you please guide me? Can you, can, you, can, you, can you hopefully show us where we, we need to go and then give us the courage to step towards that? Right? To, to pray to be blessed. There's some meat on that. It's not a risk-free prayer. When I pray at the beginning of worship, bless this time that we might be aligned with your will. That's a bold ask, for it is saying that we may or may not be lined up with your will. Please get us in line. And then blessed to bless others. This, as far as I can tell, is like the first moment in Scripture where God makes it clear that this is good news for all people. Abraham is blessed to, to be a blessing. But what that means is that we go out from here, having spent this time practicing, discerning, being guided by God's will, be discerning how it is we are to use our time and our gifts and our treasures and our talents. And then we go out, blessed to be a blessing, is to then go out to be willing to see every person out there as blessable. Every person we see is to see them as being able to be turned towards Jesus. Right? This is the beginning of evangelism. We are blessed so that we can go out and bless the world. To put our hands on it and say, you are good and God has a plan for you and let's claim that plan and here we go. Thanks be to God. Amen. I invite you to stand and join with me as we confess our faith together.